There we go. So hi, welcome everyone to New Year, New Day in Publishing with literary agent Lori McLean. This event is produced in partnership with the San Francisco Writers Conference, um, of whom Lori is a director. Uh, my name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco, and we work very closely with the Writers Conference um, to provide uh, learning experiences for writers. Because the last thing librarians want to read is bad writing. So uh, that's why we partner well together. <laughs> um, and I'm assisted today uh, by my colleague Rick Holman, who you can't see, but, but trust me, he's there. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest designed to serve the public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Right now, due to the pandemic, all of our activities are virtual, but we will be reopening soon. Uh, more details about that are on our website. I encourage you to become a member with us. It is only $120 a year. And with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, now our speaker today is Lori McLean, who spent 20 years as the CEO of a multi-million dollar marketing agency and eight years as an agent uh, at Larson Pomada, Larson Pomada Literary Agents before co-founding her own agency, uh, Fuse Literary, in 2013 uh, with her business partner, Gordon Warnock. At Fuse Literary, Lori specializes in middle grade, uh, young adult, and adult genre fiction, including romance, fantasy, science fiction, mystery, thrillers, all the fun stuff. Um, to say all the guilty pleasures of the pandemic, right, Taryn? <laughs> exactly. Um, and as I said, she is the direct, a director of the director of the San Francisco um, Writers Conference. So I'm going to put her social media tags in the chat space. And um, the way it's going to work today is Lori is going to present her material, and then we'll take questions. I'd love it if you would post these in the chat space as opposed to the Q&A space, um, just because it's easier for everyone to engage um, surrounding your question. But we will make every effort to pose it directly to Lori, um, if that is what uh, is clear from your question. So thank you very much. and. Uh, for turning out this morning. And thank you, Lori, also for coming to share your knowledge. Well, thank you, Taryn, too. And thanks, everybody, for getting up early on a beautiful Saturday. I know as soon as I'm done, you're all going to speed out of your houses and uh, enjoy this incredible day. I mean, even in, I live on the, in the coastal mountains south of San Francisco. Welcome to my home office. See, you get, you get a peek at where uh, all the, the business is done but I'm sure you're all gonna jump out there. I mean, it's gonna be 70 on the coast, so I expect traffic to be heavy, but I don't care. I'm only going out to my back deck and enjoy the sun, maybe read a book. Um, I did wanna start with one exciting announcement. I mean, it is exciting that Mechanics is opening up again in person and I'll certainly, I mean, if there was a reason to go to San Francisco, that's probably it at this point, but we have committed to do the San Francisco Writers Conference in person next February 17th through 20th. So yay! I know you all probably missed it a lot when it didn't happen last month. I know I missed it much more than I thought I, I would. I was kind of excited that, wow, after you know 17 or 16 years of doing it, I actually get to spend Valentine's Day with my husband. This is great. But <laughs> throughout that entire weekend, I was going, you know, at this time, I'd be doing dot, dot, dot. You know, my husband finally, after like the 18th time, said, yeah, yeah, I know. You'd be uh, at the, the party, the gala on Saturday night, drinking a, a writer's block cocktail. Okay, got it. I'm like, oh, I guess I have been saying that a lot. Anyway, uh, registration is open. Go to the website, sfwriters.org. Uh, the price right now is $6.95. It will stay that way till August. We usually raise it um in the summertime but um eh, we're gonna leave it there for a while 
and I welcome you all to come. Now let's see, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll talk to you about new year, new day in publishing because it really is. You guys, um, publishing in 2020 was, as, as all of us were, was very discombobulated, didn't know what was gonna happen. Stop buying books from agents. I, I mean, I sold more books in January of this year than I did the entire last year, um, 2020, uh, 2020. So I sold more in January, 2021 than the whole previous year, which is insane. But let's look at the reasons why first. So take a little trip back to 2020. I know none, none of you want to, I guess you can stick your uh, fingers in your ear and look away, but let's talk about the changes that happened in 2020. As we all know, everything came to a screeching halt. Um, publishing was scared. Will anyone buy books? Are, is everyone just gonna binge watch Netflix and Disney Plus and all the myriad other ones that are coming online? Um, and if they do buy books, how are they gonna buy them? Are they going to buy print? Are they going to buy eBooks? Are they gonna buy everything from Amazon? Sneak peek, yes. Um, but how are they gonna do that? And then they panicked. They pushed all the bestseller books that were due in 2020 off to either late 2020 or 2021. And then they pushed them further off and even further off. I mean, some of my clients, um, it's been a year and three months. I think that's the, the longest time that they pushed it off. Um, and they started buying less and less new books. Then something really weird happened. They took a deep breath. They looked at the sales numbers and they were shocked because more books were selling than at any time in the past decade. Not only that, their costs, uh, their overhead was cut in, you know, by like 40, 50% because everybody was working from home. So they didn't have any of the costs of keeping their building up and going. I mean, the poor security guards, I'm sure they got laid off. A lot of people got laid off, janitors and stuff. You could just shut down the buildings. And most of these big five publishers were in big buildings, high rises in New York. So they saw their overhead really collapse. And that was a good thing for them financially. They saw book sales go through the roof and that was a good thing for them financially. And it will be interesting to see how that affects publishing moving forward. But let's, let's go back to 2020 again. They developed a plan. They pivoted to social media promotions and online book selling. They started filling the production pipeline with books again, I'd say mid-year last year. And they figured out how their staff could work effectively um, remotely from home and publishing thrived. In fact, 2020 was their most profitable year in decades upon decades upon decades. So that was a surprise. And of course, publishing operates in such a slim margin anyway, they tried to figure out, well, what are we gonna do with this extra money that we hadn't budgeted for? What's next? What's gonna happen in 2021? So why did book sales skyrocket? Well, they were driven by wave after wave of content need due to the pandemic. I mean, kids, we're getting we're remote learning, right? They needed educational or scholastic plus entertainment books because maybe they'd been looking at that computer for four hours um, doing their schoolwork. And then maybe they wanted to play games, but maybe they also wanted to read books. Um, you had a whole plethora of entertainment options for kids, but also parents bought a lot of school books. And adults needed nonfiction and fiction titles to understand the evolving situation that was nonfiction. In fact, more nonfiction political books sold in 2020 than anything else. Um, but they also needed fiction to escape and, and stay sane. You know, the best way to escape if you're locked up in your house is a book. Um, Obama's Promised Land memoir sales were huge. It was the best selling book um, even though it came out after the election, but it was the best-selling book in 2020. And backlist titles like Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens, that was huge sales. So she got another huge bump from that. Two big franchises, Twilight and The Hunger Games, published new titles. So all these things um, played into the pent-up demand to occupy ourselves when we couldn't go anywhere. Um, and publishing will continue to grow. So let's, let's go into 2021 now. All these statistics are from the NPD group, which is BookScan. And BookScan is kind of the official 
way to uh, calculate taking a strategic sample of sales, they extrapolate how many books were sold in a year. 751 million print books were sold in 2020 and 191 million eBooks were sold in 2020. That's an 8% growth in sales over 2019. And this is in an industry who's, um, if they get 1% profit, they're lucky. So this was a, I, I'm not uh, exaggerating when I say that is a banner year for publishing. Backlist type Titles grew by 4% with 14 million more backlist titles sold compared to the previous year. Um, in 2004, there were 51% of the books sold were backlist. And in 2020, that rose up to 67%. So you could see that, you know, uh, what do they say? A high tide floats all boats. That was certainly true for backlist titles. Trade paperbacks saw the highest gains up by 36 million units last year. And e-books grew by 12.6% sent to uh, 19 million units, which is actually good. If you look at the top two lines of 750 million and the 191 million, that is a bigger percentage of e-books than we've had in any year as well. And then if, if we thought that was good, holiday sales were up 12% over 2019, which was also a really big year for uh, holiday sales. Digital audio sales were up 17%. Again, these numbers are phenomenal for one year. Um, and the reason why I say it's going to continue to grow is that in the first month of 2021, book sales were up 22% year to date. Now, I don't expect it to continue at that rate, um, but 2021, you know, we're already, what, end of March, and things haven't really changed all that much. People are still spending most of their time at home, working from home. A few of them are going back in, but offices haven't reopened. Um, I mean, people who are working in our essential services, yeah, they're still overwhelmed and I'm sure they all have PTSD and I hope the government supports them <laughs> with a lot of help, psychological help. They're gonna need it, um, but you know, first month of 2021 is looking good for the rest of the year. Let's talk about specific parts of the industry because I know all of you write different things. So nonfiction books, book sales outpaced fiction. This is very topsy-turvy. Um, the increased sales of nonfiction benefited from a lot of the social justice movements in the U.S. and abroad. You saw a lot of those kind of books explaining um, what it was to be Black living in a white world or a woman living in a man's world and other social justice movements. Um, DIY nonfiction sales skyrocketed because people were forced to stay in their home and that dripping sink or that um, you know paint job that never got finished or the deck that's falling in, you know, all of a sudden those things were front and center and you couldn't ignore them any, anymore. So a lot of people bought DIY, do it yourself, uh, nonfiction books, so they could fix those things themselves. Um, cookbook sales also soared. I mean, it's amazing how many people don't know how to cook. They just went out to restaurants every night or ordered in. So as they decided they wanted to learn how to cook, they either bought boxes like HelloFresh that were delivered to them, or they bought cookbooks um, or, or, you know, joined services online. But as they, more and more of them ate at home, I think that's going to continue. I think cookbook sales will have a, a decent um, growth pattern moving forward into 2021. And of course, for obvious reasons, diet book sales also uh, uh, went up, they soared. I can tell you, I, I got the pandemic 10 for sure that I'm trying to lose, but uh, my body's not uh, working with me here. Finally, crafts and hobby books also saw big sales. And you can imagine if you ever wanted to, you know, take up knitting again or learn how to crochet or play chess and you couldn't go to mechanics, you know, but now you can. So use all those skills you learned during the pandemic and uh, become a force in the chess room. The losers were books on religion, health and fitness, reference, business, and travel. But all that means is look for them to grow in 2021. The other area that grew amazingly was comics and graphic novels. 
you had, you know, kids who were reluctant readers, perhaps, but man, they love comics and they love superheroes and they, they would even try a graphic novel if it was about something they were interested in. And manga sales skyrocketed rocketed as both children and adults discovered their appeal. Sales rose from 14 million to 30 million, so more than doubled in one year. Popular categories were social themes, fantasy, activity books, study aids to some degree, and language arts. But adult comic and graphic novels grew 3.7%. Kid comics rose 0.5%. YA titles grew 0.2%. Uh, Everyone wanted to be entertained. And yeah, you can read books. They're an investment of time. Whereas a comic, you can blaze through that and have a few chuckles. So comics and graphic novels, um, what I've seen as an agent is more and more publishers are buying them too. And for example, Penguin Random House just took over um, distribution in bookstores from, gosh, I think it was DC Comics. It was mainly going through um, comic bookstores. And now they're once again uh, going into regular bookstores as they open. Online book sales went ballistic. That's probably something you all uh, experience and you all know. The, and this looks to be a permanent trend for 2021 and beyond. It's comfortable. Sometimes it's less expensive. You can find everything online and you get it delivered to your home so you don't even have to get dressed and go out to shop. Um, I'm not really an introvert, but that even appeals to me. Uh, In-store sales of books were down only 2% in 2020, but they are declining at a more rapid rate so far in 2021. So I like to think of it as an ecosystem. Sure, buy some stuff from Amazon. Um, it's very convenient and it's affordable, but also support local bookstores, support local business, because if they go away, we are really screwed. I, I don't want to be at the hand of a monopoly. So just include it in the ecosystem. I'm not saying don't ever buy from Amazon again. I, I think that's foolish, but do buy from, you know, do spread your money around. Um, online book sales rose 43%, so almost doubled. And Amazon was already a huge force in the market. But online sales of everything are now firmly entrenched in people's routines. I mean, people who were afraid to buy online, they were forced to, and they saw how easy it was. And, you know, I don't know. I, I feel like there's no privacy left anywhere online anyway these days. Um, so, pfft. Protect yourself as much as you can, and just it's part of the part of the society we live in now. Um, but here's one of my predictions for 2021: is I believe indie bookstores can rebound. Um, Barnes and Noble not, might not make it, at least not with the huge store footprints or mall uh, footprints that they have. They're trying to write that ship, but uh, I don't know if James Daunt is going to be able to do it. He's the, the guy, uh, British guy who took over Barnes and Noble. And um, we'll see. He hasn't done too much to impress me yet, but it's only been three months. So I, I'm ready to give him more time. But small indie bookstores really understand the importance of community. So they will survive. Uh, if not exactly thrive. A couple of weeks ago, I was on um, a, a panel talking about um, predictions for 2021. And one of the guys in the panel said, well, you must be talking to other bookstores than I am because every bookstore I talk to just bemoans the fact that they are just scraping by on the bottom, um, that sales have dropped off and uh, they're not being able to keep their staffs and blah, blah, blah. And so when I say they understand the importance of community and they will survive, um, they're not going to thrive. And this is where we all come in, because if we do buy books from them, either occasionally or exclusively, we're going to help them through this period of adjustment. Because 2021 really is going to be an adjustment as people start to get vaccinated and venture out more and feel comfortable going into stores and restaurants and bars and, and other retail establishments. Um, you know, I hope bookstores are one of them, but um, rather than buy everything from Amazon, you know, visit your locals too. Um, indie bookstores are absolutely rocking drive-by distribution and delivery. So take advantage of those services that helps them employ people. Uh, readers understand the value of local indie bookstores. So the hope is that they'll support the entire ecosystem online and offline moving forward, as I've said four times already today. 
Um, new companies like bookshop.org also couple the ease and value of online shopping with financial support for brick and mortar stores. And if you don't know about bookshop.org, go ahead and take a look. Um, a lot of organizations, San Francisco Writers Conference, for example, has a page of books by all of our presenters from Writing for Change last September. Oh, and Writing for Change is definitely going to be online every September. Um, we had, we, we tripled in the amount of people that we could uh, reach, as you might expect, and grew from a one-day conference held in San Francisco to a week-long uh, inspiration conversation uh, part of it, and also then a two-day writing conference. And it was all online on, on uh, Crowdcast. And it was so successful, we're gonna keep that going moving forward. But bookshop.org was our bookstore because right there, while you were listening to somebody, you could click on bookshop.org right from Crowdcast and actually buy the books. So it worked out, it was so seamless, it was wonderful. Okay, I know a lot of you are indie authors and I wanted to make sure I got the news out to you. Get ready for growth. Audiobooks could be huge for indies if they can move beyond um, Amazon's ACX platform, which unfortunately ACX doesn't do a lot of marketing unless you already sell a ton of books. And those are really bestsellers in print and ebook will become you know, the bestsellers in audiobook. But audiobook sales have gone through the roof and um, there's some new things going on, alternate publishing formats, formats, I guess I'd call them, and they are starting to emerge where they are seamlessly integrating ebooks and audiobooks. So say you're reading an ebook and then you're gonna you need to commute or you need to take your kids to school or you want to go shopping or whatever, then automatically the audiobook, you know, can start to um, talk to you, read the book to you. So um, Serial Box is just one of them. They're going to be changing their name to Realm. But I think for now, if you went to SerialBox.com, serial you'd see what's going on. A lot of celebrities have invested in these, um, these startups. And I don't know, it's to me as a former technologist, this is very exciting um, because I've, I've always liked the idea of um, nonlinear storytelling or something that's so seamless, it doesn't matter if you're reading a print book, reading an ebook, listening to an audio book, participating in some kind of uh, interactive story. Um, if those could be seamless, I think more people would give it a shot. Um, so look at Serial Box, Radish, Crazy Maple Studio, and Tapas Media. Crazy Maple Studio does more genre fiction, romance. They're just starting to get into mysteries and thrillers. And Tapas Media, they do a lot of novels, but they also do where they make most of their money, I think, is in their graphic novels and comics. Uh, Radish, gosh, you know, that's probably the one I know the least about. I haven't sold anything to them, but... Um, I believe they're uh, mostly fiction. And Serial Box is cool. They, they hired a bunch of senior editors who got laid off because they were uh, high expense for publishers. And they all went to Serial Box and a whole bunch of celebrities invested in it. And they do serialized fiction. So you buy it by the episode. But if you wanna buy the whole book, it's always 9.99 and that's ebook and audiobook. So it's a cool model, I like it. I hope it succeeds. Um, as e-reader sales skyrocketed, digital content also soared. If uh, KDP titles can be marketed effectively, uh, sales will increase even on backlist titles. And remember, um, indie authors, with your backlist titles, don't just let them languish. You can combine them together into a you know super mega box or something and sell it like that and adjust the price and have a different cover. And you can try all kinds of things like that because you own all those rights. Um, and people are reading eBooks a lot more than they have in the past. Digital means mutable. Well, I guess I just said this. The author has con more control, try new covers, new pricing, sales, repackaged series or bundles, works from short stories to epics can be marketed together. Get your book included in an anthology of similar books from other authors and change your metadata over time so it continues to be relevant. And I'm not talking about the metadata of, you know, your title, your ISBN number, things like that. I'm talking about metadata like keywords. Um, if something happens that uh, brings, you know, so, so one of my, um, one of my uh, colleagues 
this morning sent me a pitch that she's doing on a, a romance that one of the characters is a flight attendant. And I said, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's been happening in airlines recently. Make sure that metadata reflects those things. And also make sure that, you know, the romance that's going on, I would think the airlines would want to make that person an influencer. So make sure you use some of this terminology in this book when you're pitching it. Um, so that's what I mean by uh, mutable metadata. Um, make sure that your keywords, you should be doing this all the time for holidays if they apply or current events or just events in general, or if um, you know society has a word that is um, apropos to what your book's about, you should be changing those keywords. And what that means is keywords is, is how are people looking for what your book also um, says. So if somebody, in that example I just gave you, if somebody said airlines, you know, maybe that would come up if um, if this author had put airlines as one of her keywords. Okay. Remote learning and book growth. Um, remote learning has changed the way kids relate with online reading. Just as Apple rose to dominance in the 1980s and 90s by seeding schools with Apple products, today's kids are now perfectly comfortable with reading digital books and that will continue into adulthood. I was waiting for this kind of watershed moment when uh, kids would change the way that they interact. I thought actually it was gonna be with picture books um, when it changed from mom or dad or grandma or whoever holding the child so that the child could feel the heartbeat and interacting with the child and reading that picture book. When that fic, uh, flipped to somebody doing it with an iPad so they could show the animations or um, the sounds or whatever it was, that's when I thought a generation of kids would grow up um, issuing print books for the, um, the extras that you would get in eBooks. But instead, it happened during the pandemic. I, I saw this really cute meme the other day of a mother walking with her toddler um, down a, a city street. And the toddler was stopping at um, uh, electrical boxes or any kind of thing within reach, touching it and then wiping her hands. And I thought, oh my God, these kids, you know, they picked it up, they're running with it. Um, also watch for innovation in the merging of storytelling, video games, reading, listening, music, and more as these digital natives grow up because I don't think they're gonna go back. And then the way they teach their kids eventually 20 years down the road uh, is gonna incorporate a lot of this as well. I'm personally excited about nonlinear storytelling and create your own adventure books. I don't think we're there yet, but I got excited about this in 2009 and now I'm excited about it again 10 years later. So we'll see. It takes a long time to uh, make something popular, but um, let's see how, what happens. Also, the flip side of that is virtual book promotion is here to stay. You know, as a former business person not in the publishing industry, I always thought that the economics of sending an author on a multi-city book tour never made any sense, except for the super duper bestsellers. Um, and also with the coming of internet access back in the aughts, fans can find their authors easily online. And so that whole disintermediation, like you had to wait until um, they came to your town or you'd have to drive many hours to go to a big enough city to see your favorite author, you know, that's been reduced in demand. Fans are less motivated to come out to experience an author signing. I'm, I'm sure many of you have done an author signing and only had three or four people show up. And it's, it's really heartbreaking because you get so up for it. And then it's like, oh, three people, great. Well, I'll still do it, but man, that's too bad. Plus many bookstores are still closed. So, you know, there's, there's not much you can do about that. Fans can interact with authors online via social media and Zoom. One way this is hugely evident is school visits. So if you're a kid lit author, pivoting to virtual visits uh, is necessary. It's cheaper, it's easier. And I mean, teachers love it because it doesn't cost them anything except for the fee for the, um, for the author, which in a lot of cases has been reduced because they don't have to travel. Um, so kids really like it too. Kids are used to Zoom. 
I mean, like I said, I, I just think that's going to be incorporated into learning moving forward, and it's going to change how people interact with uh, reading devices, whether it's a print book or a Kindle. Virtual promotion is here to stay and will accelerate as new methods are tried and either discarded or adopted. So think outside of the box on your promotion. Just make sure that the box is <laughs> your screen because that's how it's going to happen. The other interesting thing, and I definitely stole this from BookScan, so props to them, but they came up with the term of micro communities. And 2020 was the year of consolidation, but I think 2020 year 21 is going to be the year of innovation. We've adapted our routines and our processes in order to survive COVID-19 and working at home, but now I feel like everyone's really getting ready to innovate, to thrive. So it's like, yeah, we survived it all, kind of. <laughs> we, uh, you know, we're ready now. We're ready now to think outside the box. And that doesn't mean going back to normal. That means, hmm, you know, there were some things about working at home I liked. Um, maybe I can keep those and innovate in other ways. So micro communities is one of those things that was born out of 2020. They are groups focused on a single voice or area of interest. Um, think mommy bloggers or lifestyle influencers, online book clubs, fashionista Instagrammers or TikTokers. In fact, there's a, now a thing called BookTok um, for TikTok people who like books. So books targeted to this demographic will accelerate their growth, the growth of micro communities. So think about that when you're thinking about how to market yourself and your books. Becoming a, an influencer or even a voice in these micro communities, um, it's a good way to sell books. You might be a member of several micro communities that were formed because you couldn't get together in real life, so they were created online. Think about how you would market to those micro communities. It doesn't have to be a big bullhorn approach, buy my book uh, about something that's unrelated, but because they know you and like you because you've been interacting in these uh, micro communities uh, over the past year and maybe even longer, um, think of a way that wouldn't be intrusive, but would allow them to know that you've got a book. And if they like you, they'll probably buy your book. Libraries and eBooks, a love story. Libraries have rocked ebook lending. It's the most popular lending in libraries today for obvious reasons. I have a few clients who are librarians and they're like, yeah, lending out print books has gone the way of the dinosaur. Yes, it will come back as libraries reopen, but lending online ebooks for a certain period of time, people are going nuts over it. Publishers need to reevaluate the pricing model for libraries though, because they are gouging libraries. Um, and Amazon even is determining what their pricing model for ebook lending to libraries is going to look like. Right now, they're discussing it. And I think if they develop a structure that succeeds, it will definitely influence traditional publishers. How traditional publishers are doing it is they are charging libraries per a certain amount of lending, like 250 lends, and then you've got to buy the book again. Whereas if they just bought a print book, that can be lent forever. So, and, and the ebook pricing model is way out of whack for libraries. It's so much more exp expensive. And, and you would think it would be less expensive because there's not a, you know, printing, binding, paper, all of that cost, shipping. My prediction is this. You'll see Amazon imprints and KDP ebooks in library catalogs by next Christmas, if not sooner. I bet a lot of you didn't even know that Amazon does not license your self-published KDP book to libraries. Maybe you did. Smashwords licenses them to libraries and have done for years, but Amazon did not. And they're looking at that now. So whatever they come up with, because they're getting a lot of pressure to keep it affordable, um, I think that's gonna influence what other traditional publishers do. And hopefully libraries will get a break because man, just like indie bookstores, they've had a hard row to hoe this past year. Publishing diaspora will continue. What is that you say? Well, more publishing workers have fled New York during the pandemic than ever before. First of all, it wasn't safe. If you remember back to the first half of 2020, New York spiked hard and people were dying in massive numbers. So people fled because they were going to live at their parents' home or they, were, they knew that they could get a house 
um, up in Westchester or out on Long Island or even in Pennsylvania or, or someplace else in upstate New York that for the price of what they were paying for their one bedroom apartment in Manhattan, they could buy a house. So um, it was also not affordable in New York and you couldn't find a lot of things. So a lot of publishing workers uh, fled New York and they still are gone. Um, and I just wonder how many of these people who now live in a, a nice house in Rhinebeck are gonna wanna um, move back to that one bedroom apartment if they can even find it. My prediction, many will not return once the pandemic's over. Now, think about how that's gonna impact commercial real estate in Manhattan all the big, huge high rises that publishers have rented out floors to other companies over the past, you know, five, 10 years. And yet, um, will they be able to? Do they need to? Do they want to keep those huge edifices to their grandeur? I don't know. I mean, that's not going to happen in 2021, but take a look at that over the next 10 years. Also, um, Zoom meetings, sorry skip one remote working remotely will become the new publishing norm hopefully um you know as far as the san francisco writers conference is concerned just one aspect is a lot of agents have been moving back home or back to where they grew up so in the san francisco bay area we have agents that work for um, large agencies in new york who now live locally so we can get them in person and that's a good thing Zoom meetings will replace in-person meetings. Publishing workers will come to New York maybe monthly for in-person meetings. But I don't know, anybody who worked in an office and, and this past year has shown us that um, when you work in an office, you waste a lot of time <laughs> in meetings, going out to lunch, everything else. I mean, the hardest thing for me, and I've been working at home in a home office for almost two decades now, the hardest thing is to turn off work um, and, and take a lunch and get up and walk around. I'll look up at the clock and am amazed that four hours has gone by. But, and that wasn't watching uh, YouTube videos or being on Facebook. It was actually working. Um, but I think there's a lot of advantages to working at home, you know, cutting out the commute, just that. Um, and so eventually I truly believe that New York will be the center of publishing in name only, even though they'll never admit it, but I think that's what you're gonna see. Oh, and did I mention diversity? That probably should have been number one. Um, diversity in publishing, both in author selection and in the publishing employees themselves is a huge, 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 cannot stress enough, huge social justice movement that I don't believe is going to go away anytime soon. In fact, it's accelerating from what began, I don't know, three, four years ago. This is great news for marginalized voices that have heretofore been silent. I mean, just look at the award-winning books in 2020 and the bestsellers. Um, it's definitely capturing the zeitgeist of Black Lives Matter, Latinx voices, LGBTQIA+, voices and the Me Too movements. They're massive right now and that's reflected in the books that are getting bought. And the popularity of these authors will only grow as time goes on. Um, so diversity is huge. So what is publishing in the new normal? It's more diverse in author and publisher employee voices. It's more innovative in the how, what, when, and where of publishing. It's more profitable, if only by a small amount, but a small amount is a big deal in publishing. It is storytelling across platforms, audio, digital, print, streaming, games. You know, the, game, the gaming industry hires more uh, writers than any other industry. It does. It's growing instead of contracting it or contracting. It's indie authors definitely have a seat at the table. It is open for business. Um, publishing in the new normal, new day, new year. In this new year, this new day in publishing, it's just gonna accelerate from all of the good things that happened because of the pandemic. Yes, some people will stop reading and go outside, but when they come back, they're still gonna read a book. So there's only so much time you can spend outside too uh, until you run back to your cave. So um, yeah, publishing is going to be very healthy in 2021 and probably 2022 as well. So thank you for listening. Now it's time for you to speak. I would like to know what questions you have. And also on here you have um, how to get in touch with me. 
Um, one thing I did over the pandemic was to change how I um, accept queries. And I had been closed to accepting queries for years. And now I am on Query Manager. So you go querymanager.com. Actually, I think if you just go to querymanager.com and put my name in, you'll get that. Um, but Lori McLean is Agent Savant, is my uh, cool way of, of putting those two identities together. Follow me on Twitter at Agent Savant. Follow the agency on Twitter at, at Fuse Literary. Our website is fuseliterary.com. Um, Check out our submission processes there. Look at the 10 agents that we have and see who fits you best. You can also follow us on Instagram at Fuse Literary and see a lot of wonderful book covers. And that is it for me. So now I have to stop sharing, right? Stop share. Yay! There Hi, we Karen. go. <laughs> Hi, that was wonderful. Um, and yes, the Mechanics Institute, as with all other libraries, have really ramped up their electronic, their eBooks, their e-magazines, their e-audiobooks um, during the pandemic. Uh, so check out your local library's catalog. Oh, and e-movies. That's another thing that we branched into. Um, well, I'm a member and I've got to go see some of those. You do. <laughs> Um, let's see, I just, there's one comment here. Will these slides be made available after the Zoom? The video for, the video we're making right now as we speak will be posted on the Mechanics Institute's YouTube page and shared with the Writers Conference and shared over social media. Um, I put in the chat the link to the uh, Mechanics Institute's YouTube channel. Uh, and what was I gonna say? Um, I hope to get that up later today or tomorrow. You know, we so can um, put it up. We have a sfwriters.org. We have a blog, um, blogs and podcasts there every week. So I can put that up as under a blog post and I'll do that. I'll do that later today. Just, Great. just the presentation. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, there, it will be available. Um, okay, now let's see. Oh, but on the YouTube channel, there are, I don't know, maybe 20 videos from past events that we've hosted with the Writers Conference. So there's, I encourage you to check it out because there's a lot of content and we got really creative over the pandemic. So um, take advantage of that. All right, our first question looks like from Bob. What are your thoughts on fiction? Which genres are in now and which are out? Any trends okay. that you can um, Yes, absolutely. Um, last year was all political nonfiction and mostly about Trump. So now that that has kind of uh, been washed out of our mouths, you will see um, not so much political nonfiction as far as fiction. Genre fiction is still like the candy. We like to you know eat and just shove it in our mouths and eat the whole thing that says shareable bag of M&Ms, but we eat it all ourselves. Um, so in romance, it is, it, we're talking about genre fiction. In romance, a lot of romantic comedies huge amount of romantic comedy. So if you have a, a hand, if you're a deft hand at writing those, um, those are good, especially with own voices. Um, K dramas are, you know, from Korea are, people have been watching those like mad. Now they want to read some of them too. As far as mysteries, cozy mysteries with all kinds of heroes and heroines um, are big. Um, thrillers, not so much political thrillers that much anymore, more domestic stuff. Um, I think it borders more on suspense than thrillers, um, but you know, uh, not tech. Tech is tech thrillers are still not all that big, but uh, things like uh, Gone Girl, um, where there's twisty endings and um, and it mostly takes place in the United States. Let's see what else um, mysteries. Uh, science fiction and fantasy. Science fiction is still growing. A lot of space operas are big. Um, have diverse crews. Uh, and your spaceships and your colonial colonizing ships going to Mars. I think uh, Elon Musk has really made Mars uh, exciting for people. So they like science fiction, but not super hard science fiction. Um, although the British audience is still very uh, hungry for that. Uh, fantasy, 
Epic fantasy is kind of going down a little bit. My hope is that urban fantasy is coming back up. And I wouldn't even call it urban fantasy anymore. I'd call it modern fantasy, where it takes place in current day. But the um, either the creatures or the, um, the magicians or the witches or whatever have you um, are interacting with us in, in our normal environment. Uh, magic is really big. Um, so I'm like selling a lot of that just sold a modern Asian fantasy that takes place in San Francisco where San Francisco is just as much of a character as the other people. And it's just making me grin from ear to ear when I was reading that. Um, sold it for six figures to tour. So lots of uh, kind of a new look at fantasy. It wouldn't be vampires in the old sense of the word. It would have to be like maybe it was energy vampires or uh, do something with, uh, what are they, the NF Tees or, or the bitcoins or you know some kind of weird technology that you have the magic for making that happen. Day traders with, uh, you know, the idea they can prognosticate the future. Um, as far as general fiction, women's fiction is still huge. Um, what else? Historical fiction, absolutely. Oh my God, World War II is popping as an era for historical fiction. So if you write that that's good. But you know what? I say this about every trend. It's more important that you write what you're passionate about than you try to chase a trend. Because by the time you chase it and get an agent and the agent tries to sell it, the trend will be trending down. So you'll have missed your shot. So just go for what you love to do. Aim to set the next trend. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Bobby has a question. Um, what role do you think agents will play in this new reality? Are they still as important to break into the industry? Very good question. I said in 2008, I mean, we, we formed Fuse in 2013. And what we did was we looked at every facet of what an agent does in the publishing industry and we blew it all up and we started from what made sense moving forwards. And I do see a lot of agencies doing that where they're much more, they're coaches, they're business managers, they're, they're concentrating on more than just selling a book and moving on because that's not worth 15% anymore, especially in self-publishing when you can just go take 70% yourself. Um, as long as Amazon, you know, lets you do that. Um, but I think what agents, the value they get is still, if you want to get into a big traditional publisher, you have to have an agent. And the reason is because the editors don't want to have to do the scouring of um, the slush pile. Um, and they, they want a certain level of writing even, and, and they turn down most of what we present to them. And that's after we've read thousands of uh, manuscript submissions a year. Um, so I, I think that part of being an agent will always be there for the larger publishers. If you're talking about regional publishers, college or university publishers, niche publishers, you don't need an agent. You might want an agent to ne negotiate that contract for you. And some agents like uh, Jennifer Chen Tran, who's always at the San Francisco Writers Com uh, Conference. She's from the Bradley, sorry, Bradford Literary Agency. Um, she is also an attorney. So she's now doing IP where she will look at your contract and read it. And it has nothing to do with her being your agent. This is just another service that she independently offers. Um, so you could get an IP attorney to look at a contract, but I don't know, I have a thing of like, maybe I'll post this as a blog post to you, but I've got a, uh, a list of 13 things that an agent does for a, um, an author. And that probably makes us still desirable. I just hope at some point the shine is off the apple where everybody thinks that agents are these super powered beings that they absolutely have to have or else they're not a legitimate author because that is nonsensical. And unfortunately, a lot of agents believe that about themselves. And if I were you, I would run away from those agents <laughs> because that's crazy. Um, you know, it's, it's this kind of a partnership. The agent is the business half of it. You're the creative half of it. When you dovetail and work well together, then your career is accelerated. That's it, basically. Um, all right, so we've talked about how agents work. We've talked about genres that are popular now. John has kind of a technical question. Does a 
published magazine article serve as a viable starting point for a book project? And would, would publishers or agents view that as evidence that there's a market for this topic? Uh, not necessarily view it as a market. Um, if you had a magazine article that got reprinted a lot of places that had amazing viral qualities to it and caused a conversation that you can then prove uh, by maybe capturing um, different places that were talking about it, different people and celebrities and, and whatever. If it really caused a hubbub, then yes. If it didn't cause a genuine hubbub, then probably no. But what happens is a lot of nonfiction agents and publishers read magazines. And when they see an article that they think is interesting, they actually contact you. So um, if you haven't been contacted and your magazine article is kind of long in the tooth now, I'd encourage you, if you're really interested in that area, to write, if it's nonfiction, you have to write a book proposal. And if you don't know what that is, um, on Smashword Short Fuse Publishing, which is our client assisted publishing arm at Fuse Literary, has a um, kind of an ebook on it called uh, Short Fuse Guide to Book Proposals. It costs 99 cents. In fact, this month, until the end of the month, it's free. So go to smashwords.com and all our short fuse guides are free to querying, to pitching. Oh, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Um, so do that. And then you'll, if, if it's nonfiction, you'll have written that. I, I think that's what you're talking about since an article that was fiction would probably be called a short story. Um, so yeah, do a book proposal and then get an agent to shop that around or just write it and publish it. I'm putting the URL for those short fuse guides um, on Smashwords in the chat Thank now. You. You're welcome. Get them, they're free. They're worth it. There's like six of them, I think. And get them this month, they're free. There's a lot, there's, yeah, there's, I think six. So that's wonderful. Um, and then Colleen has an interesting question, which maybe is uh, a great cap to this. Have you seen any really great examples of marketing lately that maybe, mm -hmm. That really stood out for you. Oh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank now, of course. This, this is like my the whole thing I went to school for that I did for 20 years of my life, and now I can't remember anything. Um, I think it's just taking advantage of when something goes viral. If you can take advantage of somebody else's viral moment, um, then that's a good thing. Or if you can create a viral moment yourself, then that's a good thing. I mean, this is so stupid, but I'll give it as an example. Um, Pepsi just came out with a new product that's Pepsi and Peeps. You know, those little yellow or now all different colored marshmallow little chicks. And that sounds totally disgusting to me, but I saw the can of it and I said, shouldn't this be called Peepsy? You know, cause that, I thought that was funny. And it blew up and people started, you know, retweeting that and laughing about it and saying it's still gross and whatever. Now, if I had something that can continue on that, either about the soft drink industry or about peeps or about Easter, you know, that's what I'm talking about, of, of taking advantage of a moment. Um, let's see, one of my bestsellers just launched the first book in her bestselling series. So this is like the third iteration of the Iron Fae, this is Julie Kagawa. And um, what she did was, um, she's an avid video game player and she's big on Twitch, which is, um, it's owned by Amazon, I think, but it's a game playing platform where you play and people watch you, which I do not play video games. So the idea of somebody watching somebody play video games is even more removed from my consciousness, but, I'm old. So younger people love Twitch. And so she decided to have her launch party on Twitch. And it wasn't that they were, um, that people were watching her play any video games. She just had all of her characters on Twitch and they could ask those characters questions. So it was these cute little like anime elves and uh, <laughs> A Cheshire cat type creatures jumping around and doing things and yet she was answering in their voices and oh my god that thing had like a thousand people um, participating and she was giving away prizes every once in a while the different characters were and it was really successful so I guess that would be my example. 
Yeah, I'm not familiar very much with Twitch, but our chess club uses it all the time to stream games oh, and yeah. lectures and stuff like that. So there's a whole other segment of the population that uses Twitch as its primary channel for whatever they want to consume. So, you know, move past Twitter, move past Facebook and Instagram and explore other um, other communities um, because you might be able to, you might be inspired by what's on there and right. what is applicable to your own uh, project. Yeah. Um, let's see. So Rachel, you don't have to be on Twitter. Check out some of the other <laughs> media streams. <laughs> um, Colleen oh, yeah. has a question. Do you have any advice for someone who would like to pitch a talk or workshop for next year's writers conference? Okay, so the San Francisco Writers Conference Planning Committee is meeting in June. So don't send us anything before June, but go ahead and send it to me, director at sfwriters.org after June. Um, we do have a whole um, plethora of track coordinators because we have fiction, nonfiction, um, business and marketing, uh, poetry, um, books to screen, and I know I'm forgetting some, I eh, can't remember what I'm forgetting. But anyway, all those people actually put together the sessions. But if you send me your resume, and I guess like when I say CV, I mean what workshops you've given in the past to what groups, then I'll definitely bring it in front of the um, track coordinators after June. <laughs> so July and after. I would say by August, we'll have everything set. So because this is a compressed time period, usually we start this activity in March. But in March, we weren't sure whether we we're going to be able to have it in, in person or not. We've, we finally said yes. I hope we don't lose our shirt. If there was ever a year that you wanted to support the San Francisco Writers Conference and come, please come in 2022. Can you tell I'm a little nervous? <laughs> Um, and then there's also the, uh, the conversations that, that we have together, Lori, with, um, with the Writers' Conference at Mechanics. Oh, cool. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's a different audience than um, what we have, what we enjoy at the conference, but it's also a great training ground for how your, how your uh, talk idea um, will play out in front of an audience right now. Yeah, right now we're just doing virtual activities because I don't know when we'll be able to meet again in person. But um, we have a lot of writers at Mechanics. Uh, about a third of our members are writers. So that's wow. more than a thousand people. So anyway, there's some overlap with the conference. Back, yeah, when we get back to that, that will be really special because the classes were like morning and afternoon with the break for lunch, small audience size of, you know, 50 or so people and an expert in a topic area. Um, yeah, I did a couple of those and they were really worthwhile for everybody. Um, yes, so let's see what else. Bobby has another question. What are your thoughts on writing a bait book on Amazon? to generate interest in your new novel, kind of like a prequel. So like maybe she's talking about a short little ebook that would serve as an appetizer for a larger meal. Well, if you're gonna do that, put it out for free because the one thing where you get bad reviews, like the number one thing is when people think they're buying a novel and they get a novelette or a novella and then they give you one star because they're like, oh, I paid 99 cents and, and I got this thing. So make sure people know what it is. Um, you could even use that if you wanted to. This is my thinking outside of the box way of looking at publishing, right? So if you're going to do a bait book, which I've never heard before, but that's cool. If you're going to do a short story like that, put something either in the beginning or in the end that says, I'm really interested to, to know whether I should write more stories in this world. Go to, you know, have something on your website or wherever they can take a survey and then you'll know whether these people actually liked it enough. I mean, if nobody responds and you know you've sold 50 books, that should give you an answer right there. But if 25 people said, yeah, I'd like that, that's 50% of the people that read it that said they'd like to read a, a longer book. So. 
it's that's an interesting idea. Answer. As a reader, I haven't heard anyone. Yeah, I haven't heard anyone doing that, but I have seen a lot of examples where somebody will put the prequel or the first book out for free on uh, KDP, and then they'll charge a little bit for every book after that in a series. That that's rampant on KDP. So. All right, are there any other questions? We're bumping up on um, time, but uh, you have some kudos here. Mary says, thanks so much for the useful update and information on relevant trends. Lots somebody of thank asked, Somebody asked, "Will oh, are we done? Because there were two more questions I found. One, some, oh. I'll ask her real quickly, Taryn, and then we can get off of here. Somebody asked uh -huh. if mystery and detective stories are still popular. Absolutely. Uh, somebody asked, uh, as an agent whose sales are climbing, how many books are you looking for compared to previous years? How many books are you expecting to sell this year? Shh. I never have any expectations, but um, I sold like 10 in January. So if it keeps going, yay, it has slowed down. But I was selling 10 and then five and then five. So yeah, a lot of books. I'm going to sell a lot of books this year. I'll just put that right out there. And I'm done. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for um, uh, showing us your home office. And I look forward to uh, working with you. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> I look forward to working I with live you. Long again. Cabin. <laughs> I want to Sorry, I keep stepping on your your ending there, Taryn. Nah, I'm just we're we're, I'm, we're just uh, we're just yucking it, yucking it up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you for coming, Lori. Thank you, all of you, for um, tuning in. And the video will be up shortly. Uh, stay safe, be well, and I look forward to meeting you all in person at the Mechanics Institute or at the conference next year. Meanwhile, we'll see each other virtually. <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>